Hello, this is Ian Wolfe, producer of Diffusion Science Radio. You can now support Diffusion through the Patreon support page at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Send me a message about the supporter awards you'd like to receive. Or make a donation directly with the PayPal button or click on an Amazon affiliate link at www.diffusionradio.com. The International Science Radio Show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Asteroid seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, sending students' projects into space with Cube Rider and bubble multiverses with John Barrow. But first up, here's the news. <laughs> It's raining innovation. When Innovation Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull was Minister for the Environment in the coalition government of John Howard in 2007, he paid $11 million of taxpayers' money for a trial of wire pyramids that he claimed could make rain from clear skies. If it worked, he would be hailed as a visionary hero who broke the drought. If it failed his loss of millions of National Water Commission dollars during a drought to pseudoscience could be hidden by the election campaign. The Australian Rain Corporation sells wire pyramids that are connected over several kilometres to generate negatively charged molecules, ions of air, that will electrostatically bind with dust. The company claimed that these negative ions and the dust they bound to would rise into the upper atmosphere where water would condense on them and form into clouds that would then make rainfall from previously clear skies. They say the negative ions and their attached dust particles reach the upper atmosphere by means of wind, atmospheric convection and turbulence. The Australian Rain Corporation presented research documents that were written in Russian, explained by a Russian researcher who spoke to a panel of Australian physicists in Russian, without a translator. They learned nothing. Appearing on the ABC TV show The 730 Report in 2007, Ian Searle, the father of cloud seeding in Australia for the Tasmanian Hydroelectric Scheme, said all the literature he has seen on the technology shows it to be a bogus science, similar to an American product called Cloudbusters that also claimed to ionise the atmosphere in order to make clouds out of blue skies and then to produce rain from those clouds. He was followed by Israel's internationally respected cloud physicist, Professor Daniel Rosenfeld, from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who pointed out that there are no scientific papers published on this negative iron method of rain cloud making. Only the patent. One can patent anything claiming it's to do anything that they like, as long as no one else has made the same claims before. There's no requirement that the claims be true. A report was given to the federal government about the Australian Rain Corporation's unproven rain technology. The former head of the CSIRO Office of Space Science, Ken McCracken, and the Emeritus Professor of Physics from the University of New England, Neville Fletcher, said they were highly sceptical about the technology and recommended that a trial only go ahead after more scientific work on the proposal, and only if it could be done at no great expense. They recommended no more than $2 million be spent exploring the science before any commitment to a grant for a trial. The report was ignored by Malcolm Turnbull. The World Meteorological Organization, WMO, have an expert team on weather modification who examined the claims that Russian negative iron pyramids have created rain in the deserts of Abu Dhabi and concluded that it just didn't work. Yes, it did rain 50 times during the trial, but that isn't unusual in this coastal region. They said in their report, it should be realised that the energy involved in weather systems is so large, it's impossible to create cloud systems that rain, alter wind patterns to bring water vapour into a region, or completely eliminate severe weather phenomena. 
Dr. Roloff Brunches, a US-based researcher who advises the World Meteorological Organization on rainfall enhancement, said as far as I'm concerned, it's physically not possible. Nobody can make or chase away a cloud. Nobody can make rain out of nothing. The coalition lost the 2007 election in a landslide to Labor. But the $11 million grant had already been allocated to the Australian Rain Corporation's trial. The Australian Academy of Sciences finally issued a statement explaining that the chaotic nature of weather means very long trials are needed to determine the effectiveness of any such technology. Trials are held over many years, with the methods for these trials set out by the World Meteorological Organization. The procedures and standards recommended by the World Meteorological Organization have not been met in the project announced by the outgoing government. This is the saddest part of the story. Regardless of whether it rained more or less, because the trials weren't conducted scientifically, nobody can actually tell whether the technology worked, despite the science arrayed against it, or not. So the $11 million was well and truly wasted. Australian rain technologies themselves stated in their 2008 report on the Queensland trials of their Atlant rainmaking technology that demonstrating a causal link between the operation of the Atlant system and rainfall would require a major scientific undertaking beyond the scope of the trial per se. In other words, they didn't try to determine whether their system worked or not. If you go to the Australian Rain Corporation's website today, it has a disclaimer in red at the top of the page, stating, For clarity, we do not make any claim to making rain on non-rainy days. Australia's Prime Minister's eagerness to grant many millions of dollars to what appears to be pseudoscience in his previous government and in his present government to wind turbine syndrome, where he's employed respiratory scientists to look into the effects of wind turbines, I don't know how that's supposed to work, while also removing hundreds of millions of dollars from real science and sacking entire fields of experienced scientists, worries me greatly. I'll report on the science policies of all the parties competing in the 2016 Australian federal election in the months to come. You're listening to Ian Wolf on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. And now steam through space. Solange Kunin is the co-founder of Cube Rider and an utter space geek. Cube Rider is selling kits to schools for students to put projects into cube satellites that will be launched into space for real. Solange gave a talk at the Orbit Oz Space Entrepreneur Meetup held at the Fishburners co-working space in Ultimo in Sydney. She spoke about how automation will destroy most jobs that are not connected to science and technology, but how experts project a shortage of people with science technology skills. I spoke with Solange after her talk and began by asking her, what is STEM and STEAM and how does CubeRider help? So STEAM is a recent development. So there's the science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the STEM that we've known for a long time. And now we're starting to include the arts. So we're shoving an A in there and calling it STEAM. And what that basically means, it makes a whole pile of sense if you're actually in STEM. You know that some of the best scientists are some of the most creative scientists, right? And so you can't really have science, especially frontier science, without the arts. It plays a big role in actually developing some of those frontier things. So we've started including that. And what we do with Cube Rider, so we're learning a lot of technical things in our, in, in our program. So students are learning how to code, how to do data analytics, how to work with hardware and electronics and things like that. But at the same time, the, for each little bite-sized section of information, there's an activity that they have to do. And a lot of those activities mean that they're starting to use their hands and actually see and feel and do the things that they're learning. And they're also combining that in with creative activities as well. So things like actually creating solutions to things out of, you know, household objects, but actually going through the process and problem solving things like, I need, I need to solve this problem, 
what can I physically do to do that? And if I've only got X, Y, Z, they end up coming up with that and that it just lets their creativity flow. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do is just, it's not you are learning STEAM, it's much more natural and just, it's just within product, the, the program itself. So your program involves kits with Raspberry Pi little computers and sensors that the students can put their own space projects that actually do get launched into space. Yeah, correct. So when schools sign up to our program, they get access to a whole pile of uh, teaching and learning resources which go over all different kinds of topics, um, all accessible online, so anyone can do it as long as you've got a Wi-Fi connection or an internet connection of any kind. And then we also ship out the hardware. So students are actually playing with and using real satellite hardware, um, it's space grade hardware, and they put it together themselves and they actually start programming it themselves. And so the hardware itself is basically a sensor module. We've got 10 different sensors on there, which would be cool for space or for Earth. Both, these schools get to keep the hardware, right? So it, it's useful for lots of things. So they're learning all these vital skills. So they're learning how to code, how to do data analytics, you know, problem solving skills and things like that. And it's all based around this hardware. The, and everything's data driven, which, which giving them a real STEM experience. Um, everything we do in today's world is, is data driven. Um, and so that's what we make them do, it's, it's all data driven. So everything that they do in their science classroom, in their maths classroom, they then create a way of collecting data and actually using that knowledge that they've learned or testing something. And so over the course of the program, they end up creating uh, an experiment for the purposes of space. So that might be measuring the changes in the magnetosphere or in Earth's gravity or even maybe trying to test time dilation. And they actually write that software experiment themselves and they give it to us and we send it to space. <laughs> it's that easy. <laughs> So what we try and do is we, this is the first time we've run it, so what we'll try and do in the future is have a launch within each academic year at least so that students get the whole, the whole experience within a short period of time. How are you getting these projects into space? So the usual way that you go to space on a, on a rocket. So we're, we'll be launching from America halfway through this year at some point, depending on scheduling, obviously. So you just basically it get installed into the rocket like any other cargo would and it goes up to the International Space Station where an astronaut unpacks all the cargo of which we are one of those little boxes. And so we're in a little box and then with a, I don't know, I assume like a sticky note or something telling them what to do with it. <laughs> Is it SpaceX you're using? So yeah, that's who we're meant to be going with. There's a whole pile of confusions just because of rockets don't always go to plan so we're working towards a SpaceX rocket Falcon 9 space lovers like dream but it might be on another commercial rocket as well depending on what happens but we're only for a SpaceX. How many schools are involved in your pilot program? Yes yeah, so we've got about 40 schools across Australia involved in our pilot program which we're very excited about so it, it's, a, it's a new program it's the first time it's been done and it's very it's, it's audacious and, and it's frightening like it's a big deal for teachers to have to, you know, it, it, it requires completely restructuring the way that they've been teaching for the last 20 years. Everything is very modern in our program. And so, you know, we've got, we've got 40, 40 schools and that, that's a lot of teachers because every, you know, it, you, we need ICT teachers, science teachers and maths teachers all teaching this. So that's a lot of teachers that have actually just willingly stepped outside of their comfort zone to deliver something that they feel is going to make a big difference on their students. So it's, it, we're really happy with 40 schools for our pilot round. So this is completely integrated into the curriculum. This is not like a project the students do after school. This is something that's part of their classroom. Yeah, so we like to be completely flexible. You can basically completely align it with syllabus dot points, which means that it can be completely integrated into the classroom. How schools want to run it is up to them. Each school is completely different, depends on uh, what they already currently run, what the students are able to do. So some schools do run it at lunchtime, but it is completely possible to run within the classroom. And we do have schools running it completely within the classroom or even as an elective where they're learning all those skills all at once in a more compact form as well. 
And about how long do the schools take to get the kids through the project until they've got something ready to send up? That's an excellent question. We're doing our pilot, so no, no black and white answers for that. But so the whole program itself goes for two terms. So it's perfect for an elective and things like that for that age group as well. So, so years seven to ten. Yeah, seven to ten mainly. And so we've got, it's interesting, we're doing some tests obviously because this is our first run. Some schools have got really advanced students and they're pushing it out really quickly. And they'll also just come back to the other content after they've submitted their space experiment. Once the projects have gone up and they've run their experiments and they've got their data, what happens to these little tiny satellite things that we're sending up? So they get chucked out of the airlock of the International Space Station and they burn up in the atmosphere. They're basically, they're trash. So, and we have, we have I don't know, around six humans living up in space at all times. And, you know, they, they make trash as well. And so we're just part of that trash at, at the end of our mission. And we get chucked out the airlock with everything and then burn up in the atmosphere, which, which is a bit strange, but... It's a lot more difficult and complex to return something back to Earth. <laughs> Do you think it might be an event the students could get a telescope and look for the little flash of their little project burning up? That would be really cool, actually. That would actually, that's the first time that's come up, that is a fantastic idea. I'm going to use that. <laughs> once these kits, once these little miniature satellites are on the space station and running their experiments how long do they go for so we're going to be on the space station for at least a month and during that month we'll be running experiments 24 by 7 right so each experiment goes from at least 15 minutes let's say for this especially for this first round we want to be as nice to these first early adopters as we possibly can and then, yeah, so then it'll just be running constantly for about a month. We can extend that if we, if we, if we really need to. But getting the code up there for, for extra experiments might be a different question. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a bit more difficult to do. So if any schools, any teachers from schools or pupils at schools are listening and they really are excited about trying to get their school involved, how do they get their school part of the Cube Rider project? So jump online, nominate your school. There's a there's um, a button that you can press under under students where you nominate your school. Let us know what school you're at. We'll give them a call and let them know that you want to do it and that it might be a great idea. Talk to your teachers. Tell them to give us a call. Just go to our website and then we can do everything that needs to be done from there. And the website is? So Kubrider, Q-U-B-E-R-I-D-E-R dot -E com. Will the students' projects be featured on Kubrider.com or that would, will be just on the school's pages? So a little bit of both. So obviously it's, it's their experiments. They can do what they want. If they don't want us to publish it, we won't publish it. Their space mission. So if they're happy for us to publish it and showcase some of the great work that they've done, then it'll definitely be up there. So if students at high school want to go into space, what should they study? Literally anything, really. Like when you look at like the, how big a space program is, don't, don't do my mistake. I thought that, you know, I wanted to work in space, so I, therefore I had to do aerospace engineering. Completely wrong. You, literally anything. You can do any kind of engineering you want. You can do any kind of science that you want, any kind of law, you know. Space missions cost money. We need like accountants to do. Like we need everyone. Like absolutely everyone. I think it's just more about getting out there and doing it. But don't don't go into go into it thinking that the only people that do space are engineers and scientists because it's completely false. The sky's the limit. I'm not going to stop at the sky. That's silly. <laughs> the solar system's the limit. No, no, I wouldn't even say that. <laughs> Come join our program. It's it's so far everyone's loved it. It's going to be great. We're making many firsts for students and Australians alike. It's going to be fantastic. Come join us. Well, Solange, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Solange Coonan, co-founder of CubeRider, a company selling kits with small computers and sensors for students to design projects to be launched in CubeSats to the International Space Station in orbit around the Earth. Find out more at CubeRider.com.
Cosmology asks the biggest questions about the biggest subject. John Barrow is Professor of Mathematical Sciences at the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge in England. I began by asking him to tell me about the eternal bubble multiverse theory. This process of inflation that I talked about, whereby there's a surge in the expansion of the universe early on. So the picture there is a very tiny fluctuation of quantum origin surges in expansion. It becomes very large. In fact, larger than the whole region that we see today and call the universe. But we also appreciate that at the time when that happened, there were sorts of other tiny little fluctuations and you know, they will all have undergone different amounts of this surge in expansion. And if we could see beyond our visible horizon today in the universe, eventually, if you looked far enough away, you ought to see some of these other regions, these expanded images of other parts of the whole universe. And they might have very, very different properties, different physics. Some of them might one day come to sort of impinge upon our universe, and you would see the effects of that. So the prediction is that the universe is very, very different from place to place if you look far enough. And then it was discovered that this scenario had an added complexity to it, that as you looked at it in time, these other little bubbles, as it were, that surged and inflated, uh, spawned other little regions within them which underwent further inflation. So uh, if we could see as all the way to infinity today, we would be able to see an innumerable number of different little fluctuations in different stages of this inflationary process. We happen to be in one of them that has certain nice properties. It got big enough and old enough for stars to form and life to exist. But uh, this has given rise to the concept and the word the multiverse. You could think of each of the bubbles as being like a little pocket universe, if you like. And the multiverse is the entire agglomeration of all of them. I like to think of it a little differently, that there's just one universe, but it has a huge amount of complexity within it. It's not the same from place to place, which is how people used to think up until about 1980-83, that they thought, well, let's assume everything is the same everywhere. It's simplest. All right, it could be very different beyond our horizon. But just remember that, that there's no evidence for it. But this inflationary theory suddenly gave you these positive reasons to expect all this complexity in the universe. And exactly the same theory that gave you this exquisite agreement between observation and theory with the maps of the background radiation has all these other weird philosophical consequences. So you have to take them seriously. So this is why one hears this concept of the multiverse mentioned. And the particle physicists you know, have a, something that's complementary, that they see how it is possible for there to be an enormous number of different sort of realizations of the laws of physics, that there are aspects of them that can fall out in different ways in different parts of the universe. And so that's an added reason why different parts of this multiverse might not just have different expansion rates of their universe and so on, but also different numbers of forces of nature, even different numbers of dimensions of space. So they could be literally unimaginably different. So this remains a big problem, a big question in fundamental physics. What you'd like to know in this multiverse scenario with all these different little patches of the universe, what's the likelihood that you live in one that looks like ours? So is our one typical or is it really unusual in some way? What's the most likely universe outcome in the multiverse? And so far no one knows how to do that calculation. I think it's a mathematical problem. It's not as hard as the problem of the dark energy. You know, why is the universe accelerating? That, for quite deep reasons, a very, very hard problem. No one's close to solving that. But to be able to work out what's the probability, the chance, that we observe a universe that looks like ours out of all the possibilities, I think this will be solved. And it's just a, a mathematical issue of how you do probability theory in this funny situation. So that's, that's something that lots of us think about and how one might calculate this. Because, I mean, one of the complexities, subtleties of it, 
that Frank Tipler and I pointed out long, long ago in that book that made the predictions about the dark energy, is that you might find that a universe like ours is extremely improbable, but it, what you're really interested in is, well, what's the probability that the universe looks like ours, given that it can also support life? So the most probable universe in the multiverse might be something that couldn't have any form of life in it. You know, it's just full of neutrinos and has no chemistry or, or anything. So it's not a simple issue of what's the most probable type of universe, but what's the most probable, given that there exist observers, and that's slightly different. Well, John Barrow, thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. That was Professor John Barrow from the University of Cambridge in England talking about eternal bubble multiverse theory. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to join us? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. You can send your contributions, opinions, congratulations, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and would like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the community radio network, including 2MVR in Nambucca Valley, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, and 3MBR on the Mallee border districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to our podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos from this week's show. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Please write to tell me what sort of supporter awards you'd like to see. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 700 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the... Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.